first of all, please join me in welcoming Denzel. Thank you. So, I will get to the question that was asked. I think it won't be my first question, though. Um, what we've decided to do tonight in terms, of, in terms of a format is to have just a pretty informal conversation. Thanks, Jim. Um, we've selected a half a dozen slides, all of images of, of works as they're installed upstairs. Um, and we're going to talk through them, mm. really, yeah. kind of one, one at a time. Um, the one that we wanted to start with was Itchin' and Scratchin', which you can see in Gallery 4. Uh, it's where the title of the exhibition comes from. Uh, it's one of the paintings that Denzel made based on the drawings uh, that he made during his time in, in Jamaica with, with Julian almost exactly a year ago, I think. Um, so by way of jumping in, Denzel, I just want to ask you, well, to reflect a little bit on this work and a, a little bit about the experience of that trip for you and about going to Jamaica for your first time. Okay. Um, well, I hadn't been to a nightclub for about over 25 years, I think, because I went in the 80s and early 90s in Hackney. And when Julian turned up at my exhibition in um, Cornwall and suggested that we'll go back to Jamaica and I can draw like I did in the 80s and 90s in the nightclubs, I was quite keen about it and excited because I'd just retired and um, things were beginning to kick off because I had two exhibitions, one in Shoreditch and one in New York. And um, it was the right time for me to do something like that because I was painting up every day, basically. And I needed to get back into drawing because I'd been teaching for 30 years at Morley College. And, like I was work only working probably a day or two um, in the studio. So going, going to Jamaica, I, I didn't expect it was going to happen when Julian suggested it. I thought, mm, that's not going to happen. And come February last year, it happened. And I was, I was glad to do it because I needed to do something like that in that stage in my life. I needed to go back to those nightclubs and just refresh myself, start drawing again and loosen up more. Um, so it helped me a lot, and we, I didn't actually know what it was going to be like anyway, but when we got there, uh, we were working a lot. I mean, we went to about five different nightclubs. Each one was slightly different. I did like the Kingston Dub Club a lot, a lot which is just outside Kingston, up in the hill. It was very reminiscent to the, to the nightclubs in Stokey. Um, but the whole, the whole package helped me a lot to get back deeply into drawing. Um, I mean, those clubs were, they were very hot. And you, you know, after about two or three hours, you could see my face, I'm sweating. Plus, I had a film crew of about five people. So it was a very different scenario from the 80s, where I was just by myself. I didn't have people actually looking at filming what I was doing. Yeah, so, I, was really, I was really curious, actually, just to jump in, how... Mm. Yeah, how was that experience of being filmed? Because you talk a lot about how sometimes you, you, you recognize that uh, parallel between what DJs are doing, who you were kind of watching, how, what you were experiencing the music of, like Jar Shaka and others, mm. and then how you were kind of performing with your charcoal, with your pencils, and how they're kind of parallel performances. Yeah. But in Jamaica, suddenly, yeah, you were under the spotlight in a different kind of way. You were less anonymous. Yeah. I mean, in a way, I've been on the spot. When I started painting, I, I went to a place called Colberston Youth Centre in Wrigley Market. It's a huge centre where people do boxing, judo, but there was an art centre there. And people used to come into the art, art room from, say, judo or boxing or bring their kids in. And then I'll be painting and they'll, they'll be so fascinated, they'll stand there for half an hour right behind you, looking at you. So I was sort of used to people's watching you and stuff. But if you're being filmed by five people, there's a different thing involved there. Because you, you're not only trying to draw the gesture drawing, the movement, you know, feel for it. But it's, it's, I mean, I got used to it, I think. But it was a different type of energy uh, um, doing something like that. But at the same time, I was quite used to um, drawing and painting in public. Because we did a thing at Is I was based at Islington Arts Factory, 
and Camden Road for 20 years. My studio in London was there. And for about four years, we did a thing called Artists in Action, where we tried to break down the mystic about making big paintings. So we actually made this stretcher in front of the general public, then the drawing, and then the painting. So there, was a, there, there, is, a, there is a thing in me, I think, where I'm not, I'm not so mystified or put off by the public. Um, being present when I'm doing things. But um, the filming of it probably, probably probably made me a bit more confident, probably, that, that sort of thing. But I, I did enjoy it, and it helped me a lot. Um, so, so when I came back in, um, to Cornwall, I had lots of... You feel re-energized. You feel, oh, I could, I could, you know, I could start getting that feeling into the paintings, um, which probably, it was always there, but these things, you always have to work at it. Because if you, if you don't, you, you lose it, basically. So you, have to still, you, you still have to work on it like you were in your 20s. So. Yeah. I, was, I was fascinated by the, uh, the comparison that Julian made between uh, the form of, of sound system, uh, speaker systems, mm. and then Naum Garbo's sculpture. Um, and seeing that, I remembered that Garbo had been based in Cornwall, yeah. where you're based. He, he was there. That's he it. was there for seven years, through from 1939 for, for seven years. That's where he spent the Second World War. Um, and to make a kind of quite clunky transition to, to your time in Cornwall now, <laughs> you, moved, you moved there three or four years ago. And, and when we were installing this, this work um, a month or so ago now, you were saying that seeing it afresh in these galleries made you realize how that kind of famous Cornish light has kind of um, infected the work somehow. Yeah. That suddenly with these, when you compare it to some of the earlier pieces that we'll get to, yeah. you get these kind of silvery highlights or overtones that are kind of pushing out or seem to sit on the surface, whereas some of the early works, they're kind of sucking you in in different kinds of ways. That's it. The Cornish light um, has affected, well, it's affected my color. It's a lot, it's a lot more violety, purpley, and more, more lighter, more lighter in weight. Um, and that, but that's the interesting thing about being a painter, moving to a different, a different place. You, you don't actually realize that. You, very similar subject matter, but the palette is changing all the time. And that was the amazing thing about Italy. When I, I went to um, Rome for two years in the 80s, I didn't actually know how different my palette was till I came back to London and looked at the paintings I did in Italy and compared it compare them to the paintings I did in London. So the beauty about doing things in different places, particularly if you paint, the color will change because of your environment, your surroundings. Yeah. So I've actually jumped on to, to the work, well, one of the works that you made when you were in Rome in the 80s, right? Yeah, Dom Night Strobe, Strobe was yeah. uh, a, a piece originally based on drawings that you'd made in a, a club in Hackney. That's it. Called All Nations. All Nations, yeah. And you told me before that this is a painting that you took with you, I think, from yeah. London to, to Rome. Rome. Mm -hmm. In London, you felt like it wasn't working, and then suddenly, in yeah. that clear Italian light, felt like something different altogether. Yeah. Yeah, what I mean is I used to come back for Christmas for two weeks to the family and stuff. And of course, Rome, I miss going to all the nightclubs because there's London was just like the most, well, like heaven, really, all the different nightclubs. So I just spent most of my time going to the nightclubs for two weeks. And I went to the All Nation nightclub, which was a very different nightclub from the club I used to go to called Phoebe's, where Shaka used to play. All Nations is a more, it's, it's, it plays reggae and disco, but it's a softer nightclub. And um, I was amazed when I went there because at, at the other night, at Phoebe's, I used to focus more on a small group of people, probably eight or nine with Shaka and the DJ. But this, I took on everything. The DJ was usually hidden away somewhere in a small room, so you hardly see the DJ. But what you are confronted with, this massive tunnel of people, you know, hundreds and all the lights and everything. And it was the only time where I decided to do a drawing for about 40 minutes. I mean, most of the other drawings were the length of a record, three or four minutes. And I was, was quite exhausted after doing the drawing. I didn't actually know it would work or anything. So I took everything back to Rome. And then uh, when I looked at it, I really wanted... It was so different 
in, in construction to the other paintings, I decided to make a painting about it. But it's interesting because after doing the painting, I realized the main thing about it is like the mosaic ball in the middle is static and everything is just woo, going mad, you know, just swirling around the place. But it's interesting, this painting with um, Stitch Up, not Stitch Up, sorry, um, uh, itching and scratching. Itch scratching. <laughs> because this painting was done in 1985, my last year in Rome. And it's, there is a similar, similar, it's similar in construction to itching and scratching. So when I came back from Jamaica last year, I realized, God, they, you know, because you, you're in a circle, you know, you, you go around in, in, in a circle all the time. I realized how similar the construction was. Um, so I decided I must do each and when I, because I didn't do each and scratching. The, I, before I did the painting, I looked at the drawing and looked at that painting, um, dub strobe, and I realized, God, this is very similar in how it's constructed. So it helped, so, so dumb, um, dub strobe actually helped me a lot to do itching and scratching the painting. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about drawing and about the construction or the underlay or the foundations of these paintings. Because yeah. all of these are kind of, they're, they're paintings that are kind of transposed from these drawings. Oh, drawings that you're often kind of making in a particular moment, surrounded by sound in the kind of ways that, that Julian was evoking. Yeah. Um, a book that's mentioned I think, was it in the film? I think, I guess it's mentioned, or it was mentioned by Julian, is uh, this book called The Natural, the Natural Way to Draw. Yeah, by Kimo Nicolaides. Yeah. A, a book from the 40s. Can mm. you tell us a bit about, about that book, how you discovered it and, and what it came to mean to you? Yeah. In the, um, after I did the Rome Fellowship, I started my teaching job at Morley, 1986. And I didn't, I'm not, I wasn't sure I wanted to teach adults. Um, so I applied for another fellowship to go to America, Harkness Fellowship, and I got it. So I went to New York. The main object of the fellowship was to try and make it commercially, try to sell the work. And then after about two or three months of dragging myself all over this contemporary galleries, nothing was happening. And that's how I accidentally went into a bookshop in Astor Place in Manhattan. And I find myself reading this book and I couldn't put it down, The Natural Way to Draw Book by Kim Michaelides. And I realized, I started reading about gesture drawing because I didn't actually realize the detail about gesture then. Although I was doing all these gesture drawings in the night clothes, starting in the end of the 70s, early 80s, I didn't actually know the detail about it. And so this book was explaining to me what gesture drawing is about, the movement, the action, the expression, what you feel there, that the thing is doing. It doesn't have, you don't have to represent the thing. You have to feel it within your own energies. So I was so excited about this book, I couldn't put it down. So I bought, the, I bought an old copy, which was, I think it came out in the early 30s, and I brought it back to London. And me and my, 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 my wife, Philippa, we constructed a class from that book and the way we work, and an artist called Cecil Collins, which we think read the book Cecil Collins, who is a tutor at Central. We did a class for about 20 years at, uh, every Saturday at the factory. Plus my class at Morley, remember I told you when I studied at Morley, I didn't read, I wasn't sure. That book helped me a lot to structure my class at Morley. And basically the main thing is the drawing aspect of it. And it helped me a lot to realize about this way of drawing that I was doing, which I'm more gesture you know, I like the movement, the action, you know, less less contour, less mass and bulk, you know, because joints are very, you know, there's about four different styles. One of, uh. the, one of the bits of Julian's film that I, I like the most is when you're pacing around that uh, drawing class, yeah. yelling at the students, don't yeah. think, yeah. don't think. And yeah. I wanted to ask you what's so wrong about thinking in, yeah. in, in that context. Well, thinking slows you down. As soon as you start, you start to think, you're not doing it. You, you're killing yourself, basically. You're losing spontaneity. You, you, you're losing freshness. In the moment, you've got to go for it. And that's the beauty about painting. And drawing allows you to enter that space a lot easier than painting. Because painting, you've got the palette, you've got the brush, you've got to mix it. Whereas drawing, you just have a tool in your hands, you know, and you could express. 
I didn't, what that's what I was saying about those nightclubs. They, I, I mean, I was about, I don't know, 17, 18 when I went. Those, those spaces, it's dark. You've got paper there. You're like in a cave. And you cannot see you cannot see what you're doing. Those are early nightclubs. They're not like nightclubs now. You could smoke weed, you could do anything you want. But it was dark, and that helped me a lot to bring my natural way to do things, which is gesture expression. Um, so if you start thinking you're starting, you're starting to use knowledge. And usually you slow down and you probably end up doing regurgitating something like someone else, you know, representational and stuff like that. Um, so it's best to act upon it, particularly if you're doing a gesture drawing. You have to act upon your emotions, your feelings, and your feelings are far more giving you a lot more than, say, sight. Because sight slows you down, basically. You don't want to use, you don't want to focus too much on it. You're going to focus on what you feel more, yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned the kind of cave, and I'm going to use that to jump, actually, to the earliest work yeah. that's in the exhibition, this piece, The Cave, which I think you titled more recently, I right? I titled it about a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah, and about so two years, yeah. You made this piece in, in 1978. Yeah. So at that time, you were a student... At Central. At Central, yeah. in London, doing yeah. painting. And I think what's, what's so striking for me about this work and what so many people have told me about seeing this work is that, in a sense, your style, your approach seems to arrive fully formed. You know, you, you're yeah. a young artist yeah. in your early 20s, mm. and yet it's all kind of there. Yeah, well, yeah in the very beginning, well, that's the, that's the beauty about, about doing something creative. There is a starting point, which you don't actually know, you probably find out 20 or 30 years after, probably. I was, you know, um, that's my, probably at my second or third nightclub, because I did quite a few before that, and, you know, you tear them up or you paint over them or whatever. But I managed to keep that for one, because it's quite, I mean, it's quite a big painting, you know, so and you have to add story and stuff like that. But in the beginning, when you start sort of um, allowing your creative, stuff to come out, you don't know that you're doing it. And that's the beauty about life, I think. Because probably if you did know, you probably, you probably might, it might regurgitate or it might be as fresh and exciting. And you would probably stop searching and finding and things like that, and the, the growth of it as well. But it's, it's always there in the beginning, and it's realizing it and finding out about it probably in the future. I mean, that's the beauty about what's happened with me now. I've been doing all these paintings and nothing happened over 40, 40 years. And suddenly now, everything has taken off. So it's good to be left, left for a while to actually strengthen what you've got. And because the more doing and doing, the stronger you get. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about this work, Stitch Up. So yeah. you made this, it's why I think it's one of the first paintings you made when you moved from London to Cornwall. I think it's about the third. And, yeah. and, it's, and it's at this kind of moment where I guess you're turning away from some of the club and dance hall paintings and yeah. you're turning back to an earlier moment in That's your life, right. one that's alluded to in the film, which yeah. was when you arrived in London. Yeah. You were 10 or 11 years old. Yeah. And mm. as you've told me before, you had to wait before you could start school for That's six it. months. Yeah, about six and months, And so yeah. your mum had you sewing bags That's in the it. basement. And yeah. so in a sense, this is, on the left, this is a self-portrait, right? It's my self-portrait, and me and my, all my family, basically, my brothers and sisters and my mom. Um, so yes, yeah, so I moved to Cornwall. The first painting I did was a seascape painting, and I had lots of problems with it. I didn't realize I have to go back to myself more. And that painting allowed me to get to this painting. And I did, I did several drawings of this painting, you know, quite a lot, probably about 10 or something. And I had this drawing of it, which I really liked, and I wanted to make a painting. It's a big drawing, it's much bigger than the drawings in the show. Um, and plus, I've been having problems with my, half my family. Um, so um, it was great doing these paintings, because I could sort my family out within myself. <laughs> and, um, one of the nice things about making these paintings, 
it's like going back in time, and because my mom um, had this lovely house on Rectory Road, and the, the people she rented the house from, she actually made bags for them as well. They had a factory, which they bring all the bits and pieces that are cut, and you stitch it together. And um, so I was, came to London about 11 and a half, and my, I had to wait about six months before I could go to school, so my mom taught me to make bags. So every time I'll come from school, at four, we'll make bags till 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I was very good, I was very fast. I was probably twice as fast at making bags than my mom. Um, so making this painting is great because I knew everything, every nooks and cranny in this painting. And the nice thing about doing this painting, um, I bring the club element, the nightclub, dance hall element. I mean, look at the speaker, look at my speaker. I mean, I had a speaker, but it was like a tiny little thing, because my mom used to buy me the latest Bob Marley records, which are like gold dust in the 70s. Um, so it was a joy in this painting, because um, again, I made it much more vibrant. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah, so, but I had lots of fun um, in doing this painting and constructing it and you, 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 using the limited palette and being in the, in the basement. Um, uh, it's, it, again, it's quite similar to them because the nightclub I used to go to, uh, Thebes, where Jack Shakapo, that was a basement as well. Yeah. So there's a sim lot of sim similar element in the painting. I gave it lots of movement, you know, and the activity. It makes but, me think also, like, how as much as your paintings are f always full of people, uh, they're also full of machines, right? Yeah. So from mm. the early pieces, the, from the turntables, mm. uh, from the strobe lights, the disco balls, here some of that gets yeah. translated yeah. to, the, in a sense, the DJ becomes... Were you on the sewing machine? Yeah. There's yeah, still a disco yeah. ball there, <laughs> hidden behind, hidden yeah. behind the lights. This is still a kind of nightclub painting, but by other means. Yeah. No, no, you're right. The machine element is very strong in it. I mean, the machine. Um, if you had a machine in the West, but like my mom had a machine since she was a seamstress. She used to, in in Grenada. She used to make the Carnival Queen dress, and the village she was from, she was like oh, very, very respected because. The machine were like magic if you had a machine. All the women will come to you and, you know, bring their dress to patch up and stuff like that. Most people didn't have a machine. But, um, but you're right. The, how, I, how I set up my, um, my position is almost as if I'm going to attack the deck, you know, spin a record or something like that. Because obviously, you know, you'd be sewing bags. There wouldn't be, there wouldn't be so much movement in it. But there is a lot of um, machinery in, in my painting. Yeah. This... This trio of works in the show, they're all from around 2000? I think late, yeah. late 90s, That's early it. 2000s. Yeah, just and, and I guess this was a moment when, what, you were going to nightclubs a little bit less? Yeah, I was going through nightclubs a lot less in the 90s. It was basically a stop, basically, in the early 90s. And um, you could see I start making things up. I start, the jo the, uh, I'll make drawings up rather than go to the nightclubs, I'll make drawings out. I mean, that one, for, for instance, had a lot of element of carnival in it. Because when I was a kid in the West Indies in Grenada, I mean, carnival was the main thing. You know, you, go, you turn up at the junction like every evening and you dance and you sing and you play st still by music. And, you know, and people practice the dance, the songs, for one week in the year where everyone celebrates. Um, so that painting was quite interesting doing it because I brought in, because someone asked about going to different islands <laughs> for the filming and stuff. Um, and I'm from Grenada, um, so it was, it was good bringing in the Calypso element into that painting, although I still have the decks and stuff, the, you know, the dub. Um, this one is a very sort of... Um, it's a mixture of night, the nightclub, the, the um, burgundy figure, a woman looking at her from the back. That's a drawing I did from the nightclub, and I really love the drawing. And um, I, wanted, I wanted to make a painting of it. Um, and that, from just be, I really, I really wanted to make something to work with the, 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 the figure on the left-hand side, and that's how that painting. 
the, the cat on the bottom is my cat I used to have um, when I lived on Rectory Road in Stoke Newington. Um, which doctor? I think you're, you're a secretly, I think, a great and quite consistent painter of animals <laughs> as well. I noticed kind of hanging the show with you, that yeah. whether it's witch doctor, the cat here, or there's a dog, isn't there, on the kind of the left-hand painting? Yeah. And then yeah. In, in the Lee Scratch Perry painting that's also in that gallery, uh, one of the, the guys there seems to kind of becoming a crocodile. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I did, when I was at Royal College, uh, every Friday, because I went to Royal College, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. That's why the main reason I got in, nightclub painting, so blues clubs. And then. But every Friday, I would go to London Zoo. And um, the Royal College, um, they were affiliated with the London Zoo, so you just go and you didn't have to pay anything. And I, I focused on the crocodiles a lot. And I, on Fridays, I would just do massive crocodile paintings in the studio. And my tutors will come in, and they, they'll open the door and look, and in a state of shock, and they'll just walk out back because I'm supposed to be doing like nightclub painters and I'm doing crocodiles. But the crocodiles were brilliant for me because they helped me to do it. There's the painting I did in um, Brixton, for Brixton Station. The original one I did when I was at the Royal College in um, 82. That painting, if you look at it, there's lots of textures and mark making all over it. And that's around the time I was doing the crocodiles. Because crocodiles, they keep still for quite a while. And the bark, the, the texture of their skin is incredible. And those, those different sort of segments of the body help me a lot. To, because when you have a massive surface, you might know, or you want a figure there or figure there, but you've got all this space. What do you do with it? How do you make it interesting for you to look at yourself? Not, not just for, you know, but, and so the crocodile, paint, crocodile painting helped me a lot. And, um, I, I you know. once asked Denzel why he painted so many crocodiles, and his response was, because crocodiles are amazing. Which <laughs> <laughs> I think is like, needs to be the title for your next show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure in one in New York next month, the one of, probably one of the best, biggest ones I did, about four meters, Peter Doyle, he's showing it in his gallery in Chinatown in Manhattan. So crocodiles can take us on to dragons um, because there's a Welsh dragon and it's smuggled into this one. Yeah. And um, so yeah, I'd like to talk about Brixton Blue. Uh, it was touched on earlier. It's this motif of three men, That's three it. three wicked men. That's it. Is yeah. something that you've been painting uh, over and over since 1982. Yeah. When yeah. the painting Three Wicked Men you first made, a painting that's now in the Tate collection. That's it. Um, I'm interested to talk about how that motif has reverberated or echoed through your work, how, how it's haunted your work, I would say. Um, mm. But before we talk about Bricks and Blue, tell us a little bit about, about Three Wicked Men. Yeah, well, I would, Three Wicked Men came about mainly because of um, a friend of mine who got killed by the police called Winston Rose. I wouldn't be able to make the paintings Three Wicked Men without... I've given you a little bit of history about Winston Rose. Because at Royal College in my first year, um, you could choose what, if, uh, you have to write a thesis. And I did my, my first thesis was on Cassie Gamers, Picasso's friend. So I didn't want to write about art history anymore. But you had the choice this time to write about anything what you want. And I'm not looking at my local news. My friend um, Winston Rose came up killed in police um, custody. Um, so I was in a state of shock because he grew up in the same house as me in Stoke Newington. His parents live on the top floor, and my parents live on the first floor. Um, so we were together for about five or six years in the same house, then they moved. And then I found out when I was at Royal College, probably about three or four years, having seen him, and came up on the news that he's killed in um, police custody. So I went to the inquest at Walton Forest a Magistrate Court, um, I recorded everything on a tape recorder. And um, so I had, you know, real documented um, information to write the thesis. I didn't want to make anything up. And after writing the thesis, I just couldn't get him out of my head because he was a horrible death. He was killed in the police. He was killed in his back garden, then carried to the police van, then on the way to, to um, the police station. They reckon he hasn't got a pulse, so they take him to the nearest hospital to confirm he was dead. 
Anyway, so I did the thesis, and I was doing... So it's my coming up to the end of my first year at the Royal College, 1981. I was doing a Jash Shaka painting, and then I thought, oh, why don't I just take Jash because Jash Shaka is in the middle of the painting. It's a big painting, it's about two, meters, two three meters. So I took Jash Shaka out, and then I put a coffin in the middle, and then so with so it's to do with Winston Rose. So it ended, the painting ended up being the burial for Winston Rose. So the whole, the whole bottom of the painting was figures from the nightclub, and the whole top half of the painting, I made it up to do with a tribute to Winston Rose. So his coffin, he's in his coffin. I used someone who fell asleep at the nightclub um, for Winston Rose's head, and his wife, and things like that. Um, so after I did that painting, I couldn't get him over, out of my head. So. One of my younger brothers, his name is Richie, they all go to nightclubs and all things like that. And they, a lot of young people, they know exactly what's happening on the street. So my brother, I come across this small A4 drawing that my brother did and with, with a normal biro. It's an A4, it's very small. He did the first drawing of the Three Wicked Men and I thought, God, that's Winston Rose. So I thought, oh gosh. So, I thought, oh, I could use this drawing, I could do something with this drawing. So I started making drawings from it. So I did about five or six drawings for it. Then I did um, two quick gestural paintings. So they're done in like in a day. And then I realized, God, I could really use this paint. I could make something of this, paint, more of this, this, this um, little drawing of Richie. So in the summer of 82, you're allowed to go in into the Royal College with no one there, no students, no tutors. You've got the studio to yourself. Because the, um, the first painting of, of Three Wicked Men, um, it was twice the size of, of the painting in the gallery. And um, I wasn't sure about doing it, and I, I couldn't, I'm not sure I wanted to be surrounded by other students. I, I, you know, it was a bit scary, basically. Anyway, so I did the painting in this, about four or five weeks in the summer. And um, I, didn't, I didn't know, but, you know, you just finish a painting like that, you're not sure about it. But the head of the Royal College, his name was Peter de France here, he's a brilliant, brilliant tutor. I didn't actually, I, I didn't know then, but in retrospect, I realized he really liked the painting. Um, so the painting started, came to life because of Winston Rose and basically my younger brother who were doing stuff that are happening on the street. And when I was doing that painting, there's a record that came out that Jashaka used to play, Three Wicked Men in My Life, the policeman, um, the businessman, and the policeman. And so that record, I got the title from that record. Yeah. So fast, we're gonna to turn to questions in a moment, so get questions ready. Um, I guess my mm. final question for you is that Fast forward 35 years from that first version of Three Wicked Men, yeah. a painting that was born out of experience of police brutality, mm. and you're invited to make a work, to make your first public commission yeah. by London Underground. Mm. And that's not going to be cited just anywhere. It's going to be cited at Brixton Underground Station, a yeah. place that you know, 35 years before yeah. Brixton had seen uprisings, riots, and so on. That's it. What was your response to that invitation? And why did you decide to make the painting that became well, Brixton Blue? Yeah, originally I never wanted to do it. Uh, Jessica, the woman who was in charge of it, she, she contacted me for about two or three months and I was ignoring her emails. I didn't know who she was. But um, Matthew Higgs, Matthew Higgs is um, a friend of Peter Doig, he's a gallery in Manhattan, where I had my, ex, my second exhibition. Sent me an email saying, oh, you must do this project. So I go, oh God, Matthew is asking me to do it now. This is, this is not very good. So I thought, oh, I must do it, because Matthew is persuading me to do it. So then I sent Jessica an email saying, I should, all right, I'll, I'll do it. Then I spoke to Philippa, my partner, and we were thinking, all the paintings I've done, what's the one that says bricks done? Oh, of course, three wicked men. But I've already done the painting in 1982, and I've done about three, then I start thinking about it, I've done about three other versions of the painting after that, so I've already done four versions of that painting. 
It's, in, it's interesting, when you start f thinking about it and you realize, oh, so I could just do a new one because that's the painting that represents Brixton with all the trouble Brixton had in the 80s. Um, so uh, I decided to change it um, because Brixton I mean, was very similar to Hackney, Dalston, lots of music, a lot of the, uh, the, the um, DJs came from that area. So in the original Brixton um, Three Wicked Men, there wasn't a DJ in the middle. So I changed it up all I'd had the DJ. The Welsh Dragon I kept, because that's from Notting Hill Carnival, when it used to be really lively. Um, and I've changed the, um, I, I removed the angel, another, another figure, which kind of angelish, but not with a long, because in, in the seventies there was a lot of, um, there used to be a lot of people working from the West Indies, working in London Underground, and they used to have the big hats, but then, then there used to be a, a London Underground logo on it. <laughs> and you start thinking, oh, yeah, this, but you don't see those anymore. So I've tried to change it as much as I can, and of course I've introduced a young person with a mobile, and the speakers, of course, because the, the original one hasn't got um, uh, any big speakers at the back. So I've brought in a lot of the music element of, of Brixton into it, but I think it's the painting, out of all the paintings that I've done, that um, echo something about um, Brixton, the brutality and stuff in the 80s. Yeah. It, it's an extraordinary painting. It's one that you can go back and see upstairs. It's one that you can go and see a vinyl mural version of in yeah. Brixton yeah. until the end of this summer. Yeah. Um, and we're happy to say this exhibition will tour on to Bristol, to Spike Island, um, in, in May or June this year. So there'll be another opportunity to, to experience it then. Um, before we turn to questions, please join me in, in thanking Denzel Forrester. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Up there in the middle. Hiya. Hello. Hello. I met you before. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I first saw your paintings and when I saw your drawing, and I now understand it starts from drawing, and then lots of drawings, and then you made actually paint. Yeah. I, I'm very interested about colors. When you saw your pictures, your colors are very, very, very different from other people's. So how do you actually choose the color when you? Yeah, well, I don't actually, I think the color just comes naturally to me, but um, probably because I was, I was, well, I was born in the West Indies, so what, but, when I went to Italy, I was more conscious that I, had, I, was, I was using color without actually thinking much of, oh, or should I use red or should I use yellow, something like that. I mean, the, the, only, the only painting probably I was more conscious of when I was um, using a limited palette was Stitch Up. There's a painting called Stitch Up where I use purples and yellows and stuff. Um, but I think got a natural thing for color, whether we like it or not. Um, so it's, it's just naturally, I don't have to um, work hard on it and anything like that. Yeah. I mean, when I do, when a lot of the time when I'm using, um, doing police painting, I tend to limit the palette to blues. But generally, they, I don't have to think much about using the color, it just comes naturally. Because it's very uh, unnatural colors, I mean, it is, Colors are natural, but it's that's yellow and purple. It's yeah. not re representing any real. So that's why I thought it was quite interesting. Your old paintings. Yeah, I mean, yellow is for me. I find yellow a difficult color to use, um, and I used to use it. I, I used to use it a lot in the eighties. We don't actually think, you know, this is the. But um, in this painting, that's why I deliberately tried to use lots and lots of yellows. Um, but it's, <laughs> it's difficult to, um, you have, the color have to mean something to you and feel something to you, I think. Um, I tell you, that's to come from within you. Um, you know. Who, who are the painters who, whose work 
I mean, painters mm. as colorists whose work yeah. well, you, like, you Mat to. Yeah, Matisse, I like, love Matisse for, um, for mm. use of color. So that, um, that's uh, Van Gogh, um, I like a lot for his color. Um, but Matisse, I think, yeah, Matisse is quite, I love his use of color. Um, El, El, Gre El Greco, uh, Spanish painter El Greco. But I think color is a thing, you, so it's have to be within you because my partner Philippa, I mean, we've been painting for, for 50, but our, our color is so very different from each other. It's incredible. So it has to come from you. That's what I'm saying about like gesture drawings. You have to give yourself over to it and go for what you feel is right. You know, you don't want to start making things up and you, know, you, have, you have to feel it between your own um, self. Hmm. Other questions? Just up at the back then. Thank you. Um, following on from that question, um, I just wondered if, I know that you were very taken by the book, about drawing, are there any other artists or is there anything else that's really inspired you um, or has really sort of been the foundations for your work? Uh, well, I know like, when I was at the art school, I did the burial painting, I realized I, I like El Greco. Spanish painters, Goya, I love Goya. I went to the Prado, I just had a field day in the Prado. When we were students, we used to travel a lot to Europe, basically. And um, I got a lot from traveling. I mean, I did a year of painting like Monet when I was at, when I was at Central in my, I think my first year. But I got over those, you know, you, you go through things. But generally I think um, Van Gogh and probably, yeah. And then the, the artist that I, I really yeah. feel a lot of in the early work in particular mm. is the work of some of the German expressionists of the oh 20s. yeah, definitely. So De I'm thinking of yeah, people like Max yeah. Beckman. Max Beckman, yeah, yeah, Max Beckman. I, I think there's a little bit flavors of thing people are alike, but um, generally, a lot of my early paintings as um, German expressionists um, feel to it, particularly when I was at the Royal College. So just after that. I think if you, if you the thing is to travel and look at paintings. You know, that's my world. And you, you know, sometimes you might be influenced by three or four years of looking at someone, you know. I remember when we went to Toledo, I was just loved El Greco. Right? I, I went to Rome and I saw some small studies they did for the massive paintings, and I was just amazed, you know. These small studies captured everything. So you're constantly being fed. I think it's important to remember also that when, when you were at art school in London in the late 70s and early 80s, there were not that many opportunities to see a lot of contemporary painting, no, right? No, For, no, to do that, no. you had to go yeah, to Europe, you had Europe. to go to New York. The London at that point was kind of yeah. still a backwater. Yeah, really. I mean, we went to the opening of the, um, the Pompidou, that was incredible. I mean, it's not very, you don't hear much about it now, but when it opened, God, it was just amazing going to that the Pompidou when it opened. There are another couple of questions at the back there. Um, it's kind of a two-part question because um, the drawings that you did of like the club dancers obviously produce really quickly and very gestural, whereas yeah. the paintings end up looking really polished, but they still keep that level of life and energy. Yeah. So I was wondering, um, how did your approach to painting compare to your approach to drawing? And then do you ever sort of struggle to sort of recreate the um, energy in the drawings and the dance scenes that you see and then put it into the paintings, if that makes sense? Yeah, there is, I mean, there is a bit of struggle in the beginning. Because I did say in the film that you basically have to do the drawings to start. You have to do the drawings because that's how the painting came about, the paintings come about. So you have to work on your drawings a lot. And then you can start being selective, saying, all right, I'm going to focus on that, that one, that three or four. Then, in the early days, I just used to go straight in with the painting or even draw with the paint. Um, and that's a lot of work. 
um, but I used to work much faster as well. Um, and it was a bit more raw, I think a bit more raw, I think. Um, but less, um, but now what I do, I do lots of studies that I know where things are going to be more. And if, it, if I draw in paint, I've got to do lots of rubbing out. I mean, I spent the first three or four weeks working on the drawing on, on the big scale. So you're doing lots of, because you have to change, you have to keep, if it's not right, you, you know, you don't, you, so you're changing it and changing it. In paint, I'll be using so much bloody white spirits or, or, or turpentine, or no, it's zest, of course, because zest is not so toxic. So I use zest now, I think it's 80% less toxic. Now you have a bit of a cloth, and you're soaking it with zest, oh, taking it off, oh, take, and if you do that, if you keep doing that, I mean, it's bloody getting into your bloody, I've been doing it for 40 years, and listen, my fingers are starting to go funny, seriously, because of all the bloody white spirits and tops I used to use in, in the past. So now I draw a lot with pencil. It's easier to change it, and I don't have to go into all the poison stuff. And then I'll draw with color, and then if I, if I think, oh no, it's not, it's not I'm, and then after about three or four weeks out in the drawing out on canvas, then I'll start painting. <laughs> so, and, and then, of course, I still might have to change the color. But I know I've sought the drawing element to it out. But it's very difficult, like you were saying, to keep spontaneity, movement and action, that kind of liveliness, that kind of dynamism, and the color fresh and alive. Because if it gets dirty and horrible, you've got to rub it down. You've got to go for the zest or whatever, clean cloth, I mean, painting is very physical stuff. You've got to feel it yourself. You know, the figure is not working. You can fill it in with your own energies. It's not working. And because a lot of the figures have lots of movement and stuff, I mean, you want that fresh, instant feel like you get in the drawings, but obviously it's harder work when you come to doing it in painting. Yeah. We have time for <laughs> one final question about, about zest or, <laughs> or otherwise. <laughs> Very expensive. <laughs> Hi there. Thank Hello. Thank, thanks for your, um, being here and, and fascinating talk and everything. Um, I have a related question, I guess, about time and your work. Mm. And basically, it seems like your method is very much about being present and not thinking, and that reflects a lot of the music and the space that you're trying to convey. But yeah. I wondered whether having a record and keeping a record f for, of, of that place, it was part of your motivation for doing that, particularly, and, or, or whether that's still part of how you view the work, um, given that those spaces have been kind of, have been lost, I guess. Or that, uh, oh, no, no, it was never to do with a record. It, I mean, it's, it's an accident, well, not an accident, um, that all the spaces in, well, London, they're gone now, but, I went to those places because they, they were the people who were there that I wanted to draw and paint. Um, that was the first and foremost thing. And plus, like I said, there were only five or ten minutes down the road from me. I didn't have to go across London. I just had to walk, you know, literally 10, 20 minutes walk and I'll be there. But, I mean, but they were such lively places. I mean, I was shocked when, they, you know, when the first time I went, I was thinking to myself, oh, this is this. But the people were enjoying themselves. They were, you could see they were... In, in heaven, dancing and doing what they do. Next day, they probably have to go to work and it's boring and whatever. But you could see for that night how exciting it was and, and, and that energy in that room and the sound and stuff like that. Um, so I didn't, I didn't do it for um, what you were saying about re, re, the recording the place and the things like that. No, it, was just, it just happens that I've recorded all these places and they've all gone now in terms of that, what they um, did in those spaces at the time was very, very um, exciting. Yeah. I don't want to finish on that melancholy note exactly. So <laughs> if there was one final question, I think I saw a hand somewhere, yeah, over here. Let's, let's have that. Hi, uh, <coughs> I'm a big fan, I really like your paintings. Um, I'm going to uni for fine art in September, and I was just wondering if you had like any advice for a young artist or something you wish someone told you when you were coming into your 20s. 
Well, it's, uh, what for? You're going for, for fine art, is it? Yeah. Um, well, drawing, really. I mean, I think drawing helps to free you and find, find you, what you have to say. So I think drawing is very important. You don't see a lot of it now. Um, drawing and, and just, just, just doing stuff that you want to do, I think, because a lot of things are sort of premeditated a lot and everything is so well structured now. You have to kind of produce the same old thing all the time. But it's, I mean, everything was in my backyard. I mean, all the stuff I did, they were just down the road from me. I mean, and it was there, but my tutors would not tell me to go and draw in those clubs. <laughs> they wouldn't have. <laughs> you got to find what you want. But drawing, I think, does help. Drawing is a way into it because it brings out something that's in you. Because, like I was saying, the gesture drawing, because there's all different styles of drawing, there's about four. So there's gesture, which I love, and there's contour, which Matisse, Matisse is famous for his contour. And Van Gogh, mark making, you know, with the bamboo. Um, so when you start, most people just do line and mass, so line and charcoal, whatever. But if you draw a lot, you realize, oh yeah, after about a year or two, yeah, I'm going this way, that's the way I'm going. So you start painting that way, and things begin to happen. But it must come from within you, and then, it, then hopefully, hopefully it will last, because if you, if, you get, if you get into it, you know, it's a lifetime, you know, if you really get deep into it. Yeah. I think that's a really good moment to finish. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Denzel. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Julia. Thank you.